So God appears to Abram again, and he takes him outside and says, Look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he says to him, So shall your offspring be. God also promises to give Abram a land to live in. But God's promised this kind of stuff before, and Abram wants proof. So God proposes a covenant between the two of them. Abram then goes to prepare the ritual ceremony for the covenant between them. Abram brings a heifer, and a goat, and a ram, as well as a pigeon and a turtle dove. He kills them all and cuts the larger ones in half, and the blood forms a pool between the pieces. Wait, what? Yep, you heard right. This was a very common practice in the desert communities of the Middle East, especially in marriage covenants, and is even still practiced today in a number of locations. It's also where we get the term cutting a covenant or cutting a deal. Now, when two parties would come together to make a covenant, they would kill these animals and let the blood ooze out between the pieces. This pool of blood is known as a blood path. The two parties must both walk through the blood path to symbolize the solemn agreement they have made. The greater party goes first, followed by the lesser, and they both say to each other, May what was done to these animals be done to me if I do not keep this covenant. So Abram waits for God, the greater party, to act, and the text then reads that a thick and dreadful darkness fell, and smoke appeared and passed between the pieces. This smoke is understood to represent the presence of God. Some examples of other places where God is represented by smoke in the Bible include the smoke that covered Mount Sinai when God came down on the mountain in Exodus. Also, each time God came to the tabernacle or the temple, it filled with smoke. God led his people through the wilderness by a cloud of smoke. Isaiah says the Lord comes in dense clouds of smoke. Also, the prophet Joel and the apostle Peter both speak of God coming with billows of smoke. And let's not forget the book of Revelation, where the temple is filled with smoke from the glory of God and his power. So, as the greater party, God defines the terms of the deal he's making with Abram. God's end of the deal is this, I will give you land and descendants, one of whom will be the Messiah. And Abram's end of the deal is this, you and your descendants must walk before me and be perfect. Really? Perfect? God wants Abram to be perfect? And neither Abram nor his descendants were by any means perfect. I mean, we've already seen that whole wife-sister scheme Abram tried to pull in Egypt. He wasn't even trying to be perfect. But it's Abram's turn to walk through the blood. But if he does, he'll be condemning himself and his descendants to death. But God stops Abram and walks through a second time in Abram's place in the form of fire, implying, if either one of us break this covenant, then I'll die for both of us. God sentences himself to die in the place of Abram and his descendants if they ever sin. Which, if you're familiar with the Jesus story at all, you already know is exactly what happens later. God damns himself for us. Now in the Bible, fire almost always represents God. Some examples of God represented by fire in the Bible include his appearance to Moses in the burning bush, his appearance as a pillar of fire to guide his people in the desert. Also, Elijah was carried away to God by a chariot of fire pulled by horses of fire. According to Exodus, the glory of the Lord looks like a consuming fire. The prophets write that God's ton is a fire and the word of God is like a fire. Also, it was tons of fire that represented God's spirit in Acts 2, and Hebrews 12.29 declares that our God is a consuming fire. So God appears as a smoking fire pot and a blazing torch and God walks the blood path in Abram's place. But later, Abram and Sarai decided that they would take matters into their own hands. Sarai was getting older and she didn't believe that she would ever be able to have children. So she told Abram to go get her servant Hagar pregnant and have a child through her instead. But after this, Hagar and Sarah began to hate each other. So Hagar runs away, but the angel of the Lord appears to her and tells her to go back to Sarai because God is going to take care of her and her son. God also told Hagar to name her son Ishmael and said that he would grow up to be a wild donkey of a man, or as less polite interpreters translate, a jackass. Hagar called God El Roy, which means the God who sees, because he had seen her in her misery and had looked out for her. So Hagar returned and had her son. Over 10 years later, when Abram was 99 years old, God appeared to him again and reaffirmed the covenant they had made so long ago. God commanded Abram to walk before him and be perfect. God then changed Abram's name to Abraham and Sarai's name to Sarah, and said that they would be the parents of many nations and kings. God gives them new identities. He makes new people out of them. Abram means exalted father, and Abraham means father of multitudes. Abram, whom we must now call Abraham, laughed at God and told him to just bless Ishmael because Sarai was just too old. And God is like, I will make Ishmael into a great nation as well, but I will still give Sarah a son, and you will name him Isaac because you laughed at my promise. Isaac means laughter. God, however, got the last laugh here when he commanded Abraham to go circumcise himself as well as all of the men and boys in his care so that every time they attempted to, 
well, <laughs> make descendants for themselves, they would look down and see what they had done and they would remember God's promise. 